Supranormal curves, aka the hypernormal curve family. This is a simple but important concept that will help in understanding material that's coming shortly in our Growth Decline series. Note to censors we use only government data. If you have a problem with the results, speak to the government. For normal distributions or exponential curves, or pretty much any other kind of curve, there's generally a formula. Plug the values into the formula and you get the value for the curve at that point. That's a bit like the formula for distance given an initial speed and an acceleration. You don't have to understand it, but here it is. s equals ut plus a half a t squared. However, there's another way of generating a curve, just as there's another way you could figure out distance travelled, based on an initial position, an initial speed, and an initial acceleration. S0 starting distance, V0 starting speed, A the acceleration, a constant. As an example, let's start at distance 0 with speed 10 miles an hour and acceleration 5 miles an hour. After one hour, you've travelled 10 miles and your speed is now 15 miles an hour, 10 plus 5. And yes, for convenience, we're assuming the changes occur at the end of each hour. In the second hour, you travel 15 miles for a total of 25 miles. Your speed is now 10 plus 5 plus 5 equals 20 miles per hour, and the acceleration remains constant at 5 miles per hour. In other words, it's an iterative process, or to use a term we use in our charts, we can project from the initial point by repeatedly creating the new figures at the end of each hour. Now we notice that for a normal distribution, the change in growth is a constant. It is always reducing. So if cases, for example, was following a normal distribution starting at cases c dot n daily new equals 10, we could have a growth factor f of 2 and a growth decline factor g of 0.9. So on day 1, new cases is f times c equals 2 times 10 equals 20. Then we adjust the factor f by f times g equals 2 times 0.9 equals 1.8. Using index notation, c0, c1, c2, f0, f1, f2, and g is a constant, and yes, that does remind one of r0 for good reason, we have that c1 equals c0 times f0, and f1 equals f0 times g, and in general, c at n plus 1 is c at n times f at n, and f at n plus 1 equals f of n, f at n times g. Or you could have c1 equals c0 times f1, and f1 equals f0 times g. The difference is slight, just whether you multiply yesterday's cases by yesterday's rate, or by today's rate. It's not material. In this version, you obviously have to calculate the new rate before you use it. That's the version we've opted for, but again, not material. It's just a choice. Why this technique is powerful is that we don't need to know parameters that might only be determined in the future. We can start with what we have and work forward from there. It's what we were doing when we projected the cases curve forward. We took the existing last value for cases and multiplied it by a reducing factor each day to match the curl over we were seeing. Now we're doing the same thing, but we have a better understanding as to what we need to be doing and why we're doing it. You've seen by now, I hope, that contagions including COVID-19, Ebola flu and the official infographics for COVID-19 all show humped curves. They're normal, or very close to normal. Once we have a humped curve, or even the substantial ascending part of a curve, we can autofit a normal as described elsewhere, chart and stats essentials among others, but we still need to have the nominal peak to give us the mean standard deviation and scaling factor. I really want to nail the fraud of the Ferguson ICCRT Report 9, and that means projecting from very limited data to a reasonably accurate outcome, or at the very least, showing that the claimed massive threat outcome was never realistic. Thus, we can't wait for peak, which will have been affected by lockdown in theory. We can only use the data available up to March 23rd, when lockdown was implemented, or March 23rd plus the incubation period in theory. Ferguson himself obviously didn't wait for peak. He seeded his term, perfectly legitimate, provided the model is legitimate, his model with the limited data available. Essentially, he used one key figure, cases doubling every five days. 
we need to show that his results and claims were fraudulent. But how? Epidemiological models, SI, SIR, SIR, simply return a massive percentage infected, whence the 80% infected 530,000 deaths in the UK, or Report 9's 510,000 deaths in the UK, 2.2 million deaths US. We've already shown that the SI, SIR, SEIR models are fraudulent, worse than flawed. They should never be used for contagion, and yet they're the official models, unquestioned except by us. We've debunked them, but we need something simpler. If we can use the limited data and show that a very different outcome was inevitable from that data, then we've achieved our goal. It both contradicts the epidemiological scare figures and demonstrates rational outcomes consistent with subsequent events. What we're going to ask is, what is the growth decline factor that is evident in that early data? If it is constant and horizontal, then it really is an exponential curve. If it is growing, heaven forbid, then it's worse than exponential. If it's declining at a constant rate, we've got a normal distribution. Those three cases are the supranormal or hypernormal, whatever my terms for convenience, family of curves. We'd already spotted that a normal distribution has this quirk, that the growth rate is declining at a constant rate. I realized that an exponential curve, multiply previous cases by the growth factor each day, has a growth rate that doesn't change. But a growth rate that doesn't change can also be expressed as a growth rate that is multiplied by one each day. As such, for both a normal distribution and exponential, you get today's growth factor by multiplying yesterday's growth factor by a number. If you multiply by 1, it's unchanged, and that's exponential. If you multiply by less than 1, it's lower, and that generates a normal curve. The only other possibility is to multiply the factor by more than 1, and then you get a curve that's worse than exponential. I call that hypernential. Perhaps the correct term is, for example, hyperbolic. But I don't recall, and I haven't got round to checking. It doesn't matter, and fortunately, with exponential being bad enough and fraudulent, we don't have to worry about hypernential curves. So exponential and normal curves, despite looking extremely different, actually are closely related. A curve with factor f equals 2 and g equals 1 is exponential. A curve with factor f equals 2 and g equals 0.99 is normal. One goes to infinity, the other falls back to Earth. Indeed, that's not a bad metaphor. We were sold a virus that would go into orbit, rocketing up until the vast majority would be infected. In fact, the virus tails off very rapidly, and it's all over in a month or two, the key difference between the exponential and normal being that, in the normal case, only a tiny fraction of the people are in fact affected. Indeed, we're at the point where even breathing will be enough to send the virus into orbit. Massive pandemic, whence masks, where in fact, as hard as governments push and exaggerate the data, they can't get the virus to be significant threat compared to normal mortality. It just keeps falling back to Earth far too fast. So you can think of the growth decline factor as gravity. We've been sold a weightless virus that easily gets to orbit. Is that reasonable? You already know the answer to that. It isn't. Not even close. Everyone was focused on r naught because that was supposed to determine how many people got infected. But that ignored a key fact. It's called r naught for a reason. After r naught, there's R1, R2, R3, and the change in R is no more or less than the growth decline that we've witnessed in our charts and analysis. R isn't identical to F, but they're effectively the same thing, and there's a formula out there for converting R numbers to growth rates. But who cares? It's fraudulent, unnecessary, and ignores the only thing that matters. How fast is that F or R number declining? The epidemiological models say it doesn't, not until, as Herr Gates put it, Basically, most of the people are infected, and there are thousands of deaths. No, that's not what happens. The growth rate does decline. It was declining from day one, and we've shown that in a lot of our charts, and it's now a standard feature, the growth rate in the bottom left charts for cases and deaths. It was never exponential, but now we're going to take it one step further. Now we're going to take the growth decline rate, G, 
that we can discover from the early data and the growth factor F likewise and the cases or deaths and we're going to generate the curve which is going to be normal because constant decline growth rates are symptomatic of normal curves that is implied by that early data. In other words we're going to look and see what really would have happened and what Ferguson should have said would have happened based on this simple concept that new cases is based on the old cases times new factor and the new factor is old factor times g. Here's what that's going to look like and it's a slightly more advanced version of the charts I've introduced in Growth Decline Part 1. This is the cases side because there wasn't much data before lockdown and deaths of course had even less. Indeed people want to have gone into lockdown earlier. Earlier than what? It was already a precipitous decision based on a very short history which went into a fraudulent model to create a scary story. So here's the full chart to 4th July endpoint but we want to look at what was available to Ferguson on the 23rd and we're going to be looking to determine the growth rate F and the growth decline rate G from that early data. So we need the growth rate data that was available to Ferguson and that's the bright magenta segment shown top and bottom. To the left of the magenta is a pale mauve. That is where cases were less than a minimum, 10 as I recall, and bet data is a bit choppy that early. After the magenta is a purple line, the growth rate experienced after that to the end of the data series. So Ferguson, had he chosen to, could have observed that magenta segment and come to a conclusion based on that. The first obvious conclusion is that it's descending. That isn't constant, horizontal. That's not exponential. And every epidemiologist should have been busy debunking the exponential meme. They weren't. Now we have an autofit normal, smooth blue, and from that we have the pale blue growth decline line from the autofit. But barring a crystal ball, which clearly he either didn't have or chose not to use, we can't base our analysis on the autofit. Only the magenta is available. So we have the dashed green line showing the growth decline line as suggested by the magenta segment. We use the bottom uncluttered panel to choose the F and G values that give us the best fit. And from the principles described earlier, applying the G repeatedly to F0, F1, F2, and applying F0, F1, F2 to C0, C1, and C2, we end up with a normal curve dashed green from that magenta section. It's the cleanest and simplest way to generate a proper projection from the early data based on sound theory. Honest, it may not seem simple, but that's why we're doing this introduction. We can compare the green dashed normal with the autofit and actual eventual data and discuss whatever we notice from that. The first and most important conclusion, however, is obvious. That magenta section is descending, cases growth is declining and doing so smoothly at a constant rate, straight line on a log scale, which the growth rate is mapped to. That isn't exponential. End of. A lot of charts don't even have a magenta section. Early data was too slight and sporadic and then they only got going late, as here for India. As such, this is as much a discovery process as a simple show and tell. We want to see how many charts had clearly defined magenta segments and whether there was a clear demonstration that the growth rate was declining even before lockdown in the UK and before other nations implemented their own measures. We're not going to do a formal accounting of each country's measures and timing. We observe that Ebola, seasonal flu, the 1918 contagion, all contagions all have normal distributions or close enough. None are exponential. All therefore have this characteristic declining growth rate. If it wasn't for Ferguson's effrontery, there wouldn't be any question. What we're seeing here is literally normal, in any contagion. However, the exponential and lockdown memes are so invasive that we'll have to look to the UK pre-lockdown and Sweden, no lockdown, for absolute nothing to do with lockdown evidence. That's it for the moment. We just wanted to give you another introduction to the new charts and their relevance to this particular inquiry. Did Ferguson have unavoidable proof that the contagion was not in fact exponential but was normal with declining growth rates so that he had no excuse to generate a wildly exaggerated scenario? 
If he chose to ignore that data or was negligent in being unaware of it, and it's pretty basic, then he either committed criminal fraud in presenting his massively exaggerated threat, or was negligent, as were the UK government and all governments who took him at his word, rather than doing the most basic analysis. And frankly, if they weren't looking at the data for COVID-19, as they tried to figure out what to do, then what were they doing? They're either unfit by criminal intent or by negligence. Either way, they're unfit to govern us, and lockdown and the whole COVID-19 agenda are fraudulent. We already knew that, but this is my best cut at an irrefutable argument that takes us directly from core data to likely outcome. It is, as an aside, therefore also a plausible tool for future use in evaluating epidemics, and rather more rational and appropriate than the SISIR SER models. And simpler too, what's not to like? I'm Andrew Mather, a 60-year-old Brit, mathematician, financier, technologist, husband, biker, pilot, healer, whatever. Feel free to get in touch, andrew at peerlessreads.com or andrew at amather.com. Either should get to me.